also very glad that they have Jerry Pink joined me as a Turkish keynote speaker. Because I think I have so many years behind me, and he has so many years ahead of him, that between us we're going to cover a large span of time. And I think that's going to be good for you, all of you. So let me start. What I'm going to say is something which has been said, has been said, and will continue to be said for some more time until the need for it is over. And I did wonder whether I should speak of this at all, because you're going to get tired of it in the next coming year. But some things need to be said again and again and again. And therefore, I thought I will talk about this. Many years back, decades back, when I was a law student, we had to study the Constitution of India. The Constitution was very new then. It was in its infancy. And I think as students, we did not know the power of the, of the document we were studying. We did not know what a wonderful new thing it was for our country. We just studied it like students study any subject. And the fundamental rights for us were just an important chapter to study. We never knew what the fundamental rights really meant to people uh, when it applied to their lives. It was much later during the emergency that I think all of us realized, all of us who were then born alive and thinking, knew what the fundamental rights really meant to every citizen in this country. Today, I look at the rights differently, perhaps with, hopefully, with a greater understanding. Article 14, which promises all citizens equality before the law, seems remarkable when I think of what it meant to a people who had been second-class citizens in their own country for, for centuries ruled by a foreign power. What it meant to a people who lived in a very rigidly hierarchical society in which people could never even hope to be equal, something over that is still with us. But before I talk of the right to equality, I will go back for a moment to an earlier and a personal story. Many years ago, I was in Cambridge for a seminar on British literature. There were five of us from the subcontinent at that seminar, three Indians, one Pakistani, and one Bangladeshi. During a casual conversation, one of these two said to us Indians, we envy you. You can stand in the middle of the street and criticize your prime minister. The other heartily concurred. I imagine we patted ourselves on the back for being a mature democracy. We had the splendid example of the time when Indira Gandhi had attempted to subvert democracy and had been voted out of power. And the motley collection of parties and individuals who had formed a government after that <laughs> had been voted out as well when it was realized that they were totally unfit to govern. We felt very good about ourselves. What made us feel even better was that we were not like our neighbors across the border. In fact, it gave us great pleasure to be envied by them and to define ourselves as not Pakistanis. That was a very important thing to feel at that time. Then recently, I read an interview with Muhammad Hanif, the Pakistani writer, who writes so critically and courageously about the sad state of affairs in his country. During the course of the interview, the Indian journalist interviewing him referred to a poem written by a Pakistani poet Kamida Riaz, who sadly passed away just a few days back. The journalist quoted a line from her poem, Tum bilkul hum jaise nikle. Muhammad Hanif's response was, how different could we be? We drink the same water, eat pretty much the same food, we breathe the same air. And finally he added, it's horrendous here, it's horrendous there. Mm. Their meaning, but India. It hurt me to read this, it shocked me. However bad things were in our country, how could anyone say we had become a Pakistan? We had our courts, which were sentinels of democracy. We had a very vital and alive uh, press. But from Muhammad Hanif's words and Fahmir Ariyaz's poem, we couched in tones of such regret that I thought we needed to take a long and hard look at our own country. What I saw was not very reassuring. In fact, it filled me with dismay. <laughs> After the 2014 elections gave the BJP a clear and strong mandate, for which many of us were thankful because we were tired of corruption and coalitions and hoped to settle down to a sensible governing to the progress that had been promised. We were sadly disillusioned. We had just entered the era of mobs. Mobs came out of nowhere, it seemed. Mobs who indulged in lynching, in barbaric killings in the name of the Holy Cow who turned into moral policemen in the name of our culture, mobs who attacked people in the name of patriotism and nationalism, 
who imposed a kind of unofficial censorship so that they decided whether a book, a film, a play, a painting exhibition, or a musical performance was fit to enter the public domain. These mobs seemed to have some kind of a patronage, for they were very rarely punished for their crimes. And on an official level, there has been, apart from a clamping down on dissent, an interference with institutions, a rewriting of history, an attempt to create a narrative of the past in tune with the ideology and desires of the ruling party. Now, with elections approaching, we are back to vote banks and voter appeasement, which have always been the name of the game of politics in India. But the promises being made now of a quick resolution of the Ram Janmabhoomi issue in favor of Hindus of Kol, the construction of a Ram Mandir, of a great statue of Sri Ram in Ayodhya, making it a symbol for the entire country, makes it clear that Hindutva, which was thrown down in the 2014 elections in favor of development and progress, is to be a major issue in the coming elections. Sadly, the Congress has jumped on the bandwagon, hoping perhaps for more Hindu votes. But hopefully, the Congress is just using it as an election strategy and will forget about it if they come into power. But for the ruling party of today, these slogans are in pursuance of the conversion of India into Bharat, a Hindu Rashtra. Something very hard to approve of for someone of my generation. We who accepted the mantra in which Pandit Nehru believed play the magic of India, unity in diversity. Just now we were listening to Damodar Mauzo speaking in Congri, switching over to English, and then we, we were told of the various scripts in which the Bonkri is written. I mean, this diversity is an amazing thing about India, I think. This mantra, along with Pandit Nehru himself, has been consigned to the dustbin of history. And the 2019 elections have become a crucial test for the country. Will India become a Hindu nation? And will non-Hindus become second-class citizens in their own country? Will Article 14 of the Constitution apply only to some Indian citizens, not to all? This will have consequences that will change the shape of this country, indeed of the subcontinent, forever, and therefore something that should concern us deeply. In all fairness, I have to ask myself whether those of us who have such fears are being unduly alarmist. Possibly, none of these things will happen. Hopefully, voters will reject the idea of an India of intolerance and hatred. I also think it is not easy to convert India into a Hindu nation. Hinduism is by its nature not a religion which lends itself to becoming a monolithic, dominating institution. And yet, when I see mobs inflamed by politicians demanding a Sri Ram temple, when I read of leaders exhorting the masses to agitate for the temple, I am frightened. One cannot but remember the post-partition violence and carnage. What is more ominous is the polarization that happened during the 2014 election. Independent India has held many elections. I have participated in many of them. But there has never or rarely been such open and ugly hatred between political parties and politicians. If you have experienced the residue of the bitterness of the 2014 elections during the past four and a half years, you have seen it in the way social media is used to troll enemies. See it in the shouting and ranting on TV, in the way abuses are traded and wild personal charges which should never be part of a political debate are made, and so on talk of Gotras. I never thought Gotras would become a political and public issue. Gotras come up only when somebody is getting married. What is the bride's Gotra? What is the groom's Gotra? Now it has become a political issue. The polarization that happened after 2014 meant that not only the country or politicians, even families were divided by a sharp, clean line. I know for a fact how much bitterness developed between friends within families. I remember I had to think 10 times before I said something to people I did not know. But you never know you where the arguments will go. There never was a midway meeting ground. The general understanding was, if you are not with us, you are against us. This has left its mark on the country, and I fear it will be worse after the coming elections. My great anxiety is, will we be able to come together again? Will we be able to live in harmony as we once did? each religion, each culture having its own place in society, none threatening the other. Once the elections are over, will we be able, able to forget the hatred, the seeds of which have been sown so generously? Or will the nation continue to be divided by the most dangerous divide of religion? Politicians in India have consistently followed a policy of dividing people. But for the first time, the divide seems alarming and threatening as it never was before. 
for me, as a writer and a person who has been keenly alive to the injustice <coughs> that women have had to suffer, almost perhaps since time began, that is another matter of great concern. I am referring to the issue of women's entry into the Shabarimala temple. I have to wonder why at such a time in the 21st century, when it should be impossible to deny women their constitutional rights, the entry of women between 10 and 50 is being so fiercely resisted. Why, day after day, mobs surround the temple and chant, not with devotion, but with a kind of ferocious frenzy to keep women away. Why they behave as if the temple is under attack. I am mystified that women themselves are a part of this opposition. In fact, at times they are more fierce than the men. And I have to ask myself whether they have been so conditioned by society that the idea of entering the temple fills them with a superstitious fear. And how can they regard menstruation as something unclean, not merely a normal physiological process? Simone de Beauvoir, in her book, The Second Sex, speaks of menstruation as life constructing a cradle in the body every month, a beautiful concept and a truth. Yet people are so determined to keep women out of the temple on the basis of the fact of menstruation that they defy a Supreme Court judgment. Talk of tradition, of a God who does not want women of a reproductive age near him, makes me suspect that the men are imposing their own misogyny on God. Is it, so is it merely anti-women? Or is it what it has now undoubtedly become a part of the political game politicians always play? Both the major parties brazenly disregarding the Supreme Court judgment and backing the traditional stand so as not to lose any votes. Whatever it seems, it seems unbelievable and sad that at a time when women have been steadily making headway in their struggle to assert themselves as an equal half of the human race, they should be regarded as lesser human beings. In fact, looking at the unrelenting opposition, a suspicion dogs me. Is the anti-women campaign in Shabrimala connected to the Me Too movement? Is it a backlash to that movement? I get a hint of how the Me Too movement is regarded in the words of a famous and popular actor in Kerala, a man who is obviously not constrained by political correctness. He calls the movement a fad, a fashion, which will soon die out. These words for a movement in which women are trying to reclaim the rights to their own body, reclaim the right to their own bodies, for a movement in which two women in the USA have taken on mm. two of the most powerful men in the country, in which Indian women took on a minister in the central government, but trivializing anything associated with women is a response which I, as a woman who writes about women, know sadly only too well. And yet, even as I write this, I read of large demonstrations here in Europe by women against sexual violence. No, Mr. Actor, this agitation will not so easily go away. I think, at the very least, women will no longer be complicit in the wrongs being done to them. More than 30 years ago, I wrote a novel, That Long Silence, which was about the breaking of women's silences. To me, the breaking of silences is the beginning of a revolution. And now, here are women breaking the silence about something which had remained secret and unspoken for centuries, sexual assault. I'm very pleased that this has happened. I'm pleased that the world is listening to women's voices and taking them seriously. I'm pleased that whatever the outcome one thing is true, men will now be apprehensive about forcing their attention on a reluctant woman even if the woman is in their power. Above all, I'm pleased that finally, shame has gone back to where it belongs, to the perpetrator of the wrong. The strangest thing about crimes against women was that unlike all other crimes, <coughs> shame, shame was attached to the victim, and therefore the silence, no longer, I hope. Yet I have some anxieties here too. Will the movement percolate down to women in small jobs, women who face harassment almost daily in their working life, women for whom their job, is of such vital importance that to speak out would be to endanger their job and make life harder for them and their family. And once again, my great fear is, will the Me Too movement make the two genders always suspicious and fearful of one another? Will there be another polarization? And will we have to live in a world of women against men? Will men and women be able to live together in love and harmony after women have asserted their right to be equal under the law? I think the answer to this can come only from men. The ball is now in their court. One of the questions asked of women who named the men who had sexually harassed them was, why were you silent all this time, <coughs> all these years? In reply, I give a quote from Caroline Norton, an English woman who lived in the 19th century at a time when married women had no rights at all. She fought a bitter legal battle with her abusive husband for the custody of her children, which she lost, of course. In the course of that battle, she wrote a letter to Queen Victoria in which she said, history teaches 
that in all cases of great injustice among men, there comes a culminating point after which that injustice is not to be born. I believe that culminating point has come or is coming for women. Behind these two issues loom a, looms a bigger one, a threat to the shining promise of equality before the law given to all citizens by the Constitution. The Shabrimala issue is an indicator that women still have to fight for their rights. And the threat to all non-Hindu citizens of becoming second-class citizens looms before us as a dreadful possibility. A country in which some citizens live with fear is a failed state. I am hopeful that the gender divide will not become a big issue because cynically I think we do need each other, we cannot live without each other. But the divide caused by religion is more dangerous. We have only to look at the bloody civil wars being fought in the world to see what can happen. All those who want a Hindu state must think of the consequences of establishing it. Perhaps we need to go back to Rabindranath Tagore's very well-known poem and think of the heaven of freedom which he prayed for, which we can enter only when all of us, whatever our religion or caste, our class, gender or language, are equal. Considering the human track record, this seems almost impossible. But the fact that so many of us continue to love, support and cherish the people in our lives should give us hope. All that we need to do is what Arjuna did on the eve of the Battle of Kurukshetra. We have only to expand the range of the world's my people to embrace all Indians. Thank you all.